everyone, and welcome to this edition of Food Biz Plus from the Food Business School of the Culinary Institute of America. My name is Kathy Joran, and I am the director of the Food Business School of the CIA, which is the Graduate and Executive Education Center of the CIA. The Food Business School's mission is to enable and empower our students to design, deliver, and lead transformative innovations that address the world's most pressing food systems challenges and what we also believe are its greatest business opportunities. Today, we're going to have a discussion about biodiversity in the professional kitchen. And the way uh, this uh, conversation is structured is in a moment, I will introduce our guest speaker. And then uh, we'll chat for about 40 minutes or so, uh, asking questions and hearing his uh, expert advice and information about the topic. You can uh, type in questions during the conversation at any time in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. I'll monitor those and we'll try to get to those as we can. At the conclusion of our conversation, um, our guest speaker will depart and please stay on for just a few minutes after that and I will let you know of upcoming Food Biz Plus and other courses that we have to offer through the Food Business School. So thank you for joining us again and let's get started. Today I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Taylor Reed, who will be joining us here. Reed's just trying to get his webcam going and we'll see him there we go. Hi Kathy, how are you doing? Thank you. So Dr. Reed is our assistant professor of applied foods in America, having joined us at the CIA about a year ago. He teaches courses in food system sustainability, farm to table, and chef community relations. His current research interests include the barriers to entry faced by beginning farmers, chefs' motivations for including foraged foods on restaurant menus, and depictions of food insecurity and food procurement in the zombie <laughs> genre. <laughs> Before coming to the Culinary Institute of America in August of 2018, Dr. Reed served as chair of the Sustainable Farming and Food Systems Program at Tompkins Cortland Community College in Dryden, New York. He has a broad background in food systems and farming in areas ranging from natural product development to farm policy, beginning farming entry, organic farming systems, and the creation of sustainable agricultural standards. Dr. Reed holds a bachelor's degree in plant and soil science, a master's degree in botany and plant pathology, and a doctorate in community food and agriculture. During our conversation today, Dr. Reed will share current insights on biodiversity and how food service professionals, and chefs in particular, can impact systemic change throughout the food system and raise consumer consciousness about this important topic. So welcome, Dr. Reed. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to see you again. And let's just start our discussion by, well, first, did you have anything to add uh, to your, uh, the introduction that I gave about you and your experience? No, I, th I thought it was great. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> All right, you're welcome. Pleasure to be here. So, <laughs> thank you. So biodiversity, as we know, is an important topic for discussion, and that's why we're addressing it today. But it seems that many people are not that familiar with it. Maybe let's start by having you uh, tell us a definition of, of biodiversity and why it should be important to all of us. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, but the biodiversity definition is fairly simple. It's just a combination of the words biological and diversity. Biological means living, um, referring to living organisms. And diversity means an, a large assortment of many different things. So biodiversity basically just means a, a large assortment of many different living things. Um, when ecologists talk about biodiversity, they usually talk about it in three different ways. Um, ecosystem diversity, which refers to a diversity of different uh, climatic ecosystems, like um, 
marine ecosystems, tropical rainforests, high deserts, uh, arctic tundra. Um, they talk about species diversity, which means the number of different species and the variety of different species within those ecosystems. And they talk about genetic diversity, which um, refers to the diversity within one specific species of, um, of living uh, creature. So um, we could talk about the diversity among, uh, the genetic diversity among the human population, for instance. And then uh, one other piece that I think is particularly important for what we're talking about today is agricultural diversity. Um, agricultural biodiversity is really important for um, how we feed ourselves and, um, and preserving agricultural biodiversity is really important for um, the, the food business um, and restaurants. Um, biodiversity is um, essential for a number of different reasons. Ecologists have shown that um, richer diversity in an ecosystem um, is uh, basically allows the ecosystem to be more productive. So the more different species you have interacting, the more biomass is produced within the ecosystem. And um, biodiversity is important because there are lots of undiscovered species out there that may be important to us as medicines or um, materials. Um, it, and biodiversity is important because different species have lots of different characteristics. Our world is changing quickly. The planet's getting hotter. Some places are coming drier, and some places are becoming wetter. Um, and as the world changes, um, all of the different species out there have very different characteristics. And some will be able to adapt better than others to the changing conditions in the world. Um, and this is particularly important in agricultural biodiversity. We have. Um, a lot of agricultural biodiversity right now. Um, there are, for instance, 40,000 different um, varieties of rice. And having all of those varieties is, is uh, fundamentally important to our being able to adapt to the changing conditions that our agricultural systems will have to exist in um, in the next 10, 20, 100 years. Um, in the restaurant world, agricultural biodiversity is also like it's the basis for new ingredients and new flavors and new dishes and, and chefs are coming up with those all the time as they um, discover new um, diverse ingredients. And it's so important for us as we think about how we're going to feed, feed the growing population of the world over the coming years, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. So why is biodiversity under threat currently? And why, what are the potential impacts of the loss of biodiversity, especially in agriculture and as it pertains to food, food related topics? Yeah, well, um, the, the UN has identified three primary causes of biodiversity lost. Um, the first is direct exploitation, and that's like uh, overfishing of bluefin tuna or overharvesting of ginseng in the forests of Appalachia. Um, the second is habitat loss. And um, when we talk about habitat loss and biodiversity, usually we're talking about deforestation and deforestation primarily in the, the um, extremely biodiverse um, centers of. Uh, like the Amazon basin, tropical rainforests have by far the most biodiversity of any ecosystem on the planet. Um, and this is where we are seeing a lot of habitat loss, a lot of exploitation. Um, primarily, uh, cutting down trees, not, to, um, not for building materials or, or paper products, although they're used for that, but mainly um, clearing forests to, um, to to gain more land for growing crops, for producing food on. Um, impacts, um, they include loss of species that are important to the ecology of individual ecosystems, loss of species that can be beneficial to humans, 
Um, decreased ability to adapt to changing conditions on the planet and loss of aesthetic value. But we also really need to remember that biodiversity is extremely important to our economy. Um, like 40% of the world's economy and 80% of the needs of the world's poor are based on biological resources. And so um, if we don't have that diversity, we're, it's, a, it's really a threat to our economic systems in a number of ways. Coral, coral reefs, for example. Coral reefs are um, about a tenth of the, one-tenth of one percent of the ocean's surface, a very small um, amount of, of the area of the ocean, um, but they hold 25 percent of the ocean's biodiversity. And it's estimated that as many as 500 million people are dependent on, um, on uh, coral reefs either for um, either for the, for making a living or for their food, and so this is this is um, a really uh, important ecosystem for biodiversity, but it's also really an important ecosystem for our our the economy of the planet. Um, right, right. It's a whole other aspect that maybe is not uh, top of mind for many people. Very important. So, what are the some of the complexities related to uh, the challenges of protecting biodiversity? I know that it's not not yeah. so easy to think about what we need to do to to protect biodiversity, yeah. and and some of the there's some complexities that in, enter into that. There are a number of challenges. I I think um, with agricultural biodiversity, the challenges are really like they relate to like the stability of nation states and um, our ability to protect the the um, important storehouses of of biodiversity that we have our our seed banks um, so for example um, the origin of the wheat plant is the fertile crescent um, which uh, is today um, modern Iraq and Syria and we know what's happened in Iraq and Syria over the last um, 25 or 30 years. And both places have lost um, really important seed banks that hold a lot of the world's uh, wheat diversity. Um, there are tens of thousands of different species of wheat, and we need those tens of thousands of species in order to be able to breed wheat that is um, uh, able to grow in uh, in future environmental conditions, which we don't know what what the world is going to look like in 25 years, and so protecting those um, those different species, protecting those um, those seed banks is is really important. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about the seed banks because I'm not sure everyone might know about seed banks that exist around the world. And we've recently heard a lot about those, you and I, from uh, representatives of Crop Trust at Menus of Change and other uh, events. But maybe explain a little bit about the seed banks of the world and, and how those are managed. Yeah, seed banks are, are extremely important for our food system and for our agricultural diversity. I mean, they're, they are the, the, the storehouse for our agricultural diversity. And Crop Trust is a, a an international nonprofit organization um, based in uh, in Germany that um, has been really working on helping to manage the world's seed banks. So there are 11 major seed banks that correspond to the world's major crops, like. Um, the International Rice Research Institute has a seed bank, and the International Potato Research Institute has, has a seed bank. And uh, Crop Trust has worked with all of those organizations to help make sure their seed banks are functioning well. You have to regularly take out um, the, the, the germplasm in the seed bank and, and, and wake it up. You can't just stick something in a seed bank and expect it to be viable in a thousand years. You have to, you have to, it has to go through its life cycle. Um, a seed bank is, is generally um, a big freezer. It's a place where um, you store a lot of seeds at uh, 
to, at a, a very cold temperatures. I don't know, 20 degrees below zero or something like that. And um, it preserves for most seeds. It preserves them for a long period of time, but periodically you have to you have to re um, regrow them and then and then collect new seeds. So Crop Trust has been working with those 11 um, seed banks to um, get their systems up and running to help them figure out what they have to catalog all their varieties to figure out what's still alive and what isn't um, and to help them to implement biosecurity measures which are really important um, to protect the seeds for the future and they've also been instrumental in developing uh, the global seed bank in Svalbard, Norway. It's sometimes referred to as the Doomsday Vault, um, which is <laughs> basically a backup for all of the world's seed resources. And um, it's housed on an island that's um, within the Arctic Circle, um, north of uh, Norway. And um, the idea is that um, it, it's a relatively stable place um, where you won't have the kinds of disruptions that we've seen in Iraq and Syria. The problem is that, um, as we know, uh, that part of the world is experiencing the effects of climate change a lot faster than uh, the rest of the, the planet. And so um, that's uh, a real threat to the future of that endeavor. Right, right. I find that the whole seed bank um, process very fascinating. And, and like you say, how they have to be regerminated periodically and, and the fact that there's this amazing backup bank, which has actually been used to replenish uh, the regional seed banks in the past when they've been destroyed by yeah. various factors. And you know, there are also a lot of other smaller um, seed banks um, that are held by individual countries. And, um, and uh, those are really important as well. But having a backup yeah. for all of this biodiversity is absolutely crucial. Right, right. So uh, please continue. You had another uh, challenge I think you were going to mention. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> the biggest challenge that we face is that we, we have an exploding population on the planet. We're looking at 10 billion people by 2050. And um, that they've estimated that we're going to have to double, almost double, um, food production in order to be able to feed all of us by 2050. And that's a huge challenge to biodiversity because we're already farming basically all of the arable land that exists on the planet. And so um, we have to figure out how to grow twice as much food on the same amount of land, or we're going to end up clearing more rainforest and um, uh, affecting biodiversity that way, and not to mention the, the, um, the climate impacts of those kinds of activities. So uh, that's, that's really, I think, the biggest challenge uh, globally to biodiversity today is the challenge of feeding uh, the number of people that we have. Right, right. No, it's a major challenge for us, for all of us. And, and for people in food service, you know, a lot of considerations to be had in terms of how can we contribute to the solutions for this challenge, right? Yeah. Um, and there are some number of organizations who are taking steps to educate both the culinary community as well as consumers about uh, biodiversity. Uh, we've talked a little bit about Crop Trust as one of those. Maybe you can uh, mention a few of the others that are involved in this area. Yeah, well, the UN and the Food and Agriculture and its uh, its Food and Agriculture Organization have been um, have been really uh, um, working a lot on biodiversity recently both of them within the last year came out with comprehensive reports that were uh, published uh, by large groups of scientists um, trying to really assess the state of biodiversity on the planet um, and uh, they're both fairly alarming in their conclusions and um, I think that in terms of organizations that may be um, you know, that, that may be the most important one because any kind of agreement about preserving biodiversity, any action that we take has to be taken globally. It's, it's like climate change itself. 
Um, it's not something that we can do unilaterally as, a, as, as uh, nations. It has to be done um, collectively, and we have to be able to agree about how to do it and, um, and uh, hold each other accountable. So uh, getting to uh, talking about how students, or I'm sorry, how culinarians can help with this. You, you uh, recently wrote an article for the United Nations Academic Impact Publication and said, uh, stated the easiest way to help students, and uh, of course ours are culinary students, uh, appreciate biodiversity is from the perspective of the kitchen. So maybe you can explain a little bit about how do, how do you teach culinary students about the importance of biodiversity? From your from the kitchen, as you mentioned. Yeah, I, one thing that I've learned is that teaching is a lot harder than I than I ever thought it was going to be. And so, um, really connecting um, connecting uh, with students' lives and and their own experiences and their own um, worlds is is the most important thing. And I do that in a couple of different ways. I do it through um, I do it through stories. And uh, I, I think that one of the most uh, impactful stories about biodiversity is the story of uh, the siege of Leningrad. During World, World War II, the, um, the Nazi army basically surrounded the city of Leningrad, which was a city of like three million people at the time, and um, cut off all their supplies. And it lasted for um, over two years. It was, the, it was the costliest siege in the history of modern warfare. Um, a million and a half people died either through bombardment or starvation. And um, it was also happened to be at that time um, the place with the most important agricultural seed bank in the world um, because there was a scientist um, in Russia at the time who had, who had done extensive travels collecting seeds from around the world. and. Uh, there was a group of scientists during the siege um, who barricaded themselves into a corner of the seed bank and uh, basically uh, to protect the seeds from uh, either the Nazis or the population which was starving to death. Uh, a million and a half people died during the siege in Leningrad. And, um, so these scientists protect, they were protecting seeds, they were surrounded by food, and nine of them starved to death while they were um, protecting the seeds there. And that's, you know, that's how important biodiversity has been to us historically. If you went back a hundred years or a thousand years or ten thousand years to any um, culture on the planet and asked them what their most important uh, resources were, they might tell you about uh, some religious iconic icons or um, poetry or art or things like that, but they'd also tell you about their seeds. And um, we have really, in, in, a, in a couple of generations, lost that uh, understanding of the importance of our seeds to our survival, to our, um, to our history, and to our future. And so I think that um, stories are really helpful in teaching about this. And for, for culinary students, they, re, they, they just, they, they intuitively get um, the importance of ingredients. And so when I show them pictures of, uh, there are 3,800 varieties of potatoes in Peru. And they all have different colors and different shapes and different sizes and, and different textures and different flavors. Um, and when we're looking at different varieties of potato, um, the culinary possibilities are uh, almost immediately apparent to them, even if they haven't spent a lot of time in a professional kitchen. Um, but uh, we, we, we don't really explore those in today's kitchens to the extent that's possible, and, um, and they are always very excited about new possibilities. And that's, you know, the, the basis of our, um, our ingredient list is our biodiversity. That's that's really what it is. So how does that translate into specific steps that chefs in restaurants or food service venues of any kind today can, uh, what kind of steps can those people be taking to protect biodiversity, to educate consumers, 
uh, who are who are their customers uh, about biodiversity and the importance of it. Yeah, well, uh, chefs have a voice today that um, that there's there's really no parallel. I mean, uh, it's it's totally different than 20 years ago, and um, and so a, a chef's kitchen is really it's it's a um, it's a podium from which to promote all sorts of things, and so. Chefs have a really important role in promoting biodiversity, and a number of them are, are doing it. Um, Alex Italia and, and Virgilio Martinez and um, Rene Redzepi and, and, and others are, you know, really by highlighting um, different ingredients on the menu, and, and especially the ingredients that are native to particular places. Virgilio Martinez, um, uh, at uh, Central in Lima uh, has a menu that um, instead of you know having different ditch dishes, the, the menu is based on different altitudes in Peru. And um, each altitude has different ingredients um, that are important to it. He uses 180 different ingredients on his menu, um, most of which have never been used in, in restaurants before. And so these kinds of things I think are the most important things that chefs can do. Um, chefs have a have a, a, a voice, and um, I think it's really important that they use that voice to expose the public to um, not just to the culinary possibilities that are uh, embedded in the biodiversity of each place, um, but also talk about um, why it's important to conserve biodiversity and the kinds of actions that we need to take to do it. And the first thing that we need to do, and a lot of chefs have been really vocal about this, um, is to address the issue of climate change. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, Crop Trust has a division. They have a variety of different um, campaigns and uh, things going on. But one of them is this Food Forever campaign with chefs. And they have also developed this 2020 for 2020 uh, campaign, right? where they're trying to sign up uh, 2020 chefs by the year 2020 who will commit to helping increase the use of diverse ingredients on their menus, which is how they would educate people uh, about different ingredients. And I know they've been holding a number of events around the world and will continue over the next couple of years to uh, have feature chefs who are using a, a different ingredient on their menu and educating people about the, the flavor of that and the fact that they're out there uh, and that you know that those that kind of diversity in ingredients can be used and don't, do you think that's a, a good idea to incorporate new ingredients and a way to educate consumers about these new uh, possible particularly grains and and, uh, yeah, yeah, there are a number of exciting initiatives like this, and I and I think they're all very important. Education is the first piece of this. You know, we have to we have to uh, rediscover the importance of our biodiversity, rediscover the importance of our uh, agricultural diversity, and our genetic diversity. And um, and chefs are the best possible spokespeople for this. So there's a number of different um, initiatives, the um, crop trust initiatives, um, like 2020 for 2020, um, uh, 50 Future Foods from NOR and the World Wildlife Federation um, is another one where they're trying to get chefs to recognize and use uh, a number of different forgotten or localized ingredients, things like fonio from Africa. Um, breadfruit, swamp taro, um, things that we've we've never heard of, but that could potentially be um, very useful agricultural crops and, and great um, uh, crops as the basis of uh, a menu. Um, and so there there are a number of um, initiatives like that. Rediscovered is another one of them. That's that's um, encouraging chefs to use a lot of different ingredients. Um, but we need to translate that into political action. And I don't think that there's really any substitute for that. We need to not just know um, that biodiversity is important for our restaurants. We also have to take concrete action. And it has to be taken um, 
this is an urgent issue. It has to be taken quickly and it has to be done in a way that is um, cooperative and uh, involves all of the world's countries. It's a daunting, it's a daunting task, but it's something that we really have to focus on. And I think chefs have a responsibility in that way too, because um, you know we we as as chefs and restaurant owners, we make our money off of biodiversity. We have to give something back to it. And um, there are a number of chefs that have been uh, really outspoken about that. So to our, our uh, listeners, please uh, put in any questions that you might have for Dr. Reed uh, into the chat area. We'll try to get to those uh, in the next few minutes. But um, our, what, what kind of resources do you recommend, uh, Dr. Reed, for, for chefs to look to readings or websites or anything like that where they can find out more information about this and how they can get involved to help this yeah, I would um, I would recommend Crop Trust website. They they um, they have uh, uh, it's an important organization and they have great resources. The two new reports that just came out from the UN and the Food and Agriculture Organization are um, I mean they're not they're not easy reads because they're uh, the the warnings are really dire, but I think they're really important to get a sense of the of the scope of the issue that we're looking at. I think that. Um, that is really crucial. And um, uh, in terms of books, I, you know, it's hard to, like uh, to come up with it. You know, it's not um, it's not an issue that you know that a lot of great fiction has been written about. There was a book that came out uh, a number of years ago um, called One River by Wade Davis, and uh, in it he he. He traces his own graduate work searching for the origin of the coca plant um, from which cocaine is made uh, in the Amazon. And uh, it's a, a fascinating story about him, about his graduate advisor's work in um, developing uh, uh, rubber trees for um, use in World War II. And it really highlights not just the, the, the vast biodiversity in the Amazon basin, um, but the importance of the connection between biodiversity and human welfare, um, not just to the indigenous people of the Amazon, but to, um, to our global community. Um, biodiversity is the basis of our, um, of our world. It's the basis of our economy. It's the basis of our food system. We're all dependent on it, and um, in many cases we're... <laughs> We're dependent on biodiversity that exists um, thousands of miles away, and that's really hard to um, connect to. So I think that stories, again, stories like that, um, One River by Wade Davis, I, I recommend it. Thank you. It sounds very interesting. Well, and uh, I think many of the chefs' organizations these days are, are addressing some of these issues in a variety of ways, so looking to things like uh, Slow Foods Chefs Alliance or Chefs Collaborative are places where you can find groups that are actively addressing some of these challenges like climate change and now biodiversity. But uh, if uh, but I think chefs, you know, being interested in adding new ingredients to their menus and introducing their consumers and their customers to new flavors that can expand horizons would be really really wonderful. Let's see, a question came in from Meng, which says, which consumer packaged good food or beverage brands, if any, might be doing a good job communicating the issue of biodiversity or raising awareness of biodiversity to consumers? Do any yeah, come to mind I, no, it's a you? It's a great question. I, you know, we were just uh, together, Kathy, at this um, innovation summit where there were a lot of, um, there were a lot of different uh, food companies. Um, including some of the biggest food companies in the world. ADM was there, Pepsi was there, Mars was there. Um, and they are all um, connecting with this issue of biodiversity. I think for, for the most part in a, in, uh, in a way that's more wholehearted and, and useful than the agricultural seed companies. Um, and, and um, you know, that the, the, uh, 
the food business companies see this as a they see the same thing that chefs see which is a whole bunch of unused ingredients and um, and flavors that could be um, could be new products and I think particularly a lot of the, the companies are looking at diversifying into new markets and the kinds of flavors that are um, uh, that that uh, are uh, good in the Indian palate are different than the kinds of flavors that are um, appreciated in the uh, American palate, and so um, a lot of the a lot of these companies are beginning to recognize um, biodiversity and are beginning to diversify their food products into um, with 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 new um, with new kinds of plants, new kinds of flavors, and new um, and, and biodiverse products. And I think that's really, right. that's exciting because they can be spokesmen for this too. But again, it, it needs to be followed with political action. Um, the, the, the economic system is not going to solve this crisis on its own. No, I think you're right, exactly. And, and you're right, we did see that all of these major food companies who may traditionally not have been offering uh, products that include these kinds of biodiverse ingredients or even what we might consider more healthful types of ingredients are really changing their the way they are operating now and adding in those things to their product lines because that's what they know consumers want and they that they also know that that's you know would be going to address the challenges that we're looking uh, toward having to deal with in the future and actually, uh, you know, as people are recognizing that dealing with these challenges and addressing these challenges over the next 5, 10, 20 years is also going to be create big business opportunities. So it, it uh, can be a win-win to address the challenges that are facing the world while we're also creating good business. Yeah. Um, let's see if I have another question here. Well. This kind of speaks to a little bit to what you were talking about in places like Peru or or other countries where uh, someone said, do older cultures hold the solution on how to feed more people with limited resources? With limited and, resources. Yeah. Wow, it's, it's a great question. It's, it's a big question. Um, you know, I think that, that, that most cultures around the world feed themselves very differently than the United States feeds itself. Like the majority of people on this planet are still fed by subsistence agriculture, and most people are feeding themselves. And I, I, am a big believer in the idea that um, we need we need people to be feeding themselves, and we need communities to be feeding themselves. And um, and I think that you know. When I uh, <clears throat> when I travel in places like Malawi, um, every square inch of land is used to grow crops. People's front yards are maize, and people's backyards are sweet potatoes. And um, I think that that's something that we can we can learn from. As I said before, we don't have any more agricultural land. The only way we get more space to um, to grow food on is either to cut down rainforest. Or to reappropriate space that's that's in other uses, and I think front yards and backyards. I mean, it sounds silly, but I think that's 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 really important prime space that we are in many ways wasting um, by growing, uh, you know, something that that is nice to look at and walk on. Um, and I think that's really something that we that we can learn from other cultures is the value of. Uh, uh, the value of our land and the value of our homes in helping to provide us with not just you know with the calories that we need but with fresh nutritious um, uh, food that that is free <laughs> that would be the that would be the big one I think um, and the, you yeah, know, the other piece is, is diversity I think you know in a, in a lot of in a lot of agricultural diversity in our in our growing systems in a lot of other cultures throughout the world you know the growing systems are still very diverse you have lots of different kinds of crops growing in a single acre um, and we've we've lost that diversity in our quest to um, produce as much as possible uh, on a single acre but what we what we know from um, looking at natural systems is that systems that are diverse are much more productive 
in terms of biomass. And uh, the, 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 um, the productivity that we have in our e agricultural systems now, um, which, is, which is really exceptional, but it's also it's, it's based on um, the use of cheap fossil fuel resources. You know, all of, the, all of the diesel fuel, all of the fertilizer, all of the pesticides that we use um, are, are basically, uh, uh, they're calories that are, that are underground as fossil fuels that we're translating into calories for food and not very efficiently. You know, it takes about 10 fossil fuel calories to make a calorie of food. And so I think diversity in our, in our agricultural systems um, we, when we rely on ecological relationships to provide the protection against disease and the, and the fertility that we need for our systems, they're much more productive um, without external inputs. And that's something else that I think we can learn from other cultures um, that, we, that we've lost in our agricultural systems in the West. Right. No, I totally agree. And when you... When you travel to other countries that are particularly uh, developing, which are retaining some of their uh, historical practices, we you do see this, right? You see this yeah. the way that they're they're able to uh, use their agricultural resources in a more productive way. So, uh, coming to uh, the time to end our conversation, uh, is there anything else you would like to say to the audience today? Well, I, I just want to emphasize, and, and perhaps I, I've done this enough already, but um, the importance of addressing the issue of climate change. You know, we need to set aside our political differences and really get to work on addressing this issue because it's about um, the future of the planet and the, and the, and the future of humanity. And so um, we can't really talk about biodiversity without talking about climate change. And we have to figure out how to talk about climate change in a way that's productive and not divisive. And um, that's been a real challenge over the last uh, few years. And, and we, need to, um, we need to address that. And, and hopefully we're starting to. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Reed. Um, please stay on, everyone. And I'm gonna, going to talk to you a little bit about what's coming up. But I also did want to mention that one of the things that CIA uh, offers is our Menus of Change initiative. It, it includes a conference which is uh, available for chefs to attend, uh, to register and attend in June at our New York campus. But the menusofchange.org website is a fabulous resource for any chefs who are interested in finding out more about what the latest science is on climate change, on biodiversity, on animal welfare, and there's, a, there's the report is available to download. You can find out all, all information about uh, what, what the latest is and what you can do to, to uh, help address some of these challenges that we're all facing in our industry. So I just wanted to mention that and thank again to Dr. Reed for joining me today. This is a very big topic and we've just touched the surface of it, but uh, there's a lot, a lot to be done and a lot of good tips uh, from you today, so thank you. So let's move on briefly, and I will tell you a little bit about what's coming up. Our next Food Biz Plus conversation will take place on September 26th, 12 p.m. Pacific and 3 p.m. Eastern. We're uh, taking a little break in the month of August when CIA has an intercession, and we'll be back in uh, September. And th there we will be talking with a gentleman about gaining traction with consumers. And this will be a little bit about marketing and packaging and things like that from Rocco Cardinale, who is the Vice President of Marketing for Franklin Foods. So please join us uh, for that session. You can sign up at uh, foodbiz, foodbusinessschool.org is the link to signing up for that Food Biz Plus session. Then I did want to mention that we also are offering some online short courses that are open enrollment, executive ed type courses with executive education rigor but, uh, and great information, but anyone can sign up. They're being uh, run through a program called, a platform called Teachable. And we have three different courses uh, available that are just uh, under a five week uh, running session right now, but we'll be offering them again in the fall from October 14th to November 15th. 
They're self-paced online at your leisure. You take these courses over a course of five weeks. We leave the content open for you uh, after that indefinitely. So you would be able to access that content. And those are all being taught by faculty members from the master's program in food business here at the CIA. And so you can get a little snippet of what is being taught in our master's program as well by taking these short courses. One about food experience design, which is about design thinking related to food. One is about food venture formation and financing, which is a wonderful program taught by Don Booter um, of a finance firm here in San Francisco about how, you know, what type of corporation you might want to consider for your business and how, how will you fund it. And then the building blocks of developing brand and marketing is also uh, one of those three courses that we are offering. You can take them individually or take them as a bundle and save a little bit of money on that. So please check that out also at foodbusinessschool.org. And finally, I'd like to mention our master's degree program in food business, which is an online program. It's a two-year program designed for professionals working in the industry who want to get a master's degree with a food business focus. And you can do it uh, from wherever you are, as long as you have good internet access uh, over the course of two years. There are a couple, there are three actually, in-person short residencies of one week or less at our campuses. And then the rest of the program is all online, uh, one to two courses per semester. And that is designed for people who are interested in starting up a food business of any type, uh, whether it be a restaurant or another food service application. It's also for people who are looking to develop a food product and launch it into the retail market. So either of those are possibilities. And for people who are working in food companies and want to achieve a master's degree to move up in their organization and innovate from within. So we say that it's a program for food entrepreneurs as well as food intrapreneurs. And uh, it's an it's a exciting program that started last year. Uh, we have only one intake per year, and the intake for 2019 is full. And the next intake will be fall 2020, and we'll be accepting applications basically any time between now and March or so of next year until the cohort is full for 2020. So check that out at ciachef.edu forward slash masters. You can also get to it through a direct link at foodbusinessschool.org. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining me and Dr. Reed in our conversation today. And I will look forward to uh, seeing you again in September for our, our next Food Biz Plus with Rocco Cardinale. Meanwhile, uh, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your 